Hi everyone and welcome to Dennis Deep Cuts, the 43rd installment of this fine YouTube series. Today we're going to talk about nostalgia. Let's see what happens. So someone told me, well the internet told me last week that it's been 25 years since The Shape of Punk to Come was released. Um, I'm going to be the actually guy here and say that actually it was released in Europe in February and then it, it got released in the States in October, a couple of weeks after we actually broke up. But yes, it's been 25 years, uh, which is wild. Um, I did a repost about the fact and I got tons of excitement and a lot of positive feedback. Um, you know, to have released their album 25 years ago and, and people still want to talk about it, people want to celebrate it, people still want to write kind of lame think pieces about it. It's quite mind-blowing. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's such a privilege. Um, and I think that's like the dream of everyone that ever sat down to write a song, to have something lasting, you know, which is crazy. But it also got me thinking about uh, the very powerful force of nostalgia. And I think this is, uh, this is true for everyone that played music for a long time. They will recognize the fact that you post something about an upcoming tour or a new EP or a new single or a new album or even a sweet little YouTube channel and the response is fine. And then you post something about something from the past and then people lose their shit. Um, so I thought that I was going to dive in a little bit and talk about nostalgia, uh, both from the angle of, of a music consumer, but also, and maybe most importantly, about how it affects creativity and, and music, basically, moving forward. <clears throat> Out of all the nostalgic elements that we have around us, music is by far the most powerful one. When you hear something familiar, the body releases dopamines, and you feel uh, a sense of well-being and comfort and this was really apparent during the pandemic when people were forced to quarantine and sit at home and listen to music and people opted and chose music that they recognize music they did listen to a million times before they chose comfort music uh, so it's really difficult to release new music during the pandemic because people wanted that comfort and they wanted something they could recognize there's also been service made where it cements the fact and the idea that most people stop discovering new music at the age of 33. There are of course multiple reasons for that, but I think one of the biggest ones is that when you are young, a music, art and culture defines who you are. It, it, it sets you on course and you find your tribe, you find your voice, you find all these things that will define you as a person maybe for the rest of your life and as you grow older those culturally significant little things might not be as important i also believe that when you're young you're supposed to be into music you're supposed to like music and as you grow older maybe not everybody loved music as much as i did or, or you guys did and then also i think that a very real thing is that um Music might take the backseat to family, jobs, other social uh, situations, you know. Um, so music becomes maybe more uh, a reminder of a different time, um, an easier time, a simpler time. Um, it reminds you of someone who you used to be. And I also think that in a world that's fragmented and scary and wildly out of control, uh, people tend to seek comfort in the things that they recognize and understand, which totally makes sense. And now there's like a whole industry geared towards nostalgia. You know, you get tours and you get festivals that aim at that specific purpose. You have 60s nostalgia acts touring and then you have uh, like something like Rebellion in the UK where it's all 70s and 80s punk bands and you have this festival when we were young. Um, that aims at nostalgia it's like people in the 30s when when they want to be nostalgic about when they listen to 90s and early 2000s pop punk and emo music um, you have your record releases that coincides with the 10th anniversary or the 20th anniversary or the 40th anniversary of a record complete with bonus material 
Um, you have a touring circuit with bands touring, playing a record from start to finish, you know, doing that thing. I mean, that's a whole world. And then you have like TV shows that, that pushes the elements of nostalgia really hard. Like something like Stranger Things, you know, like hits all that beat for people of a certain age, you know. Um, and when that becomes the norm, and that's what people want to spend their time and money on, it becomes quite difficult for, for new bands, and it becomes quite difficult for, for bands that want to keep pushing and keep developing, keep putting out new music. That being said, I don't really hate this at all. You know, um, I've also released a couple of <laughs> records, uh, you know, to celebrate 20 years or 25 years, and I'm sure I'll keep doing that because I think it's, it is a great way to celebrate your past. Uh, I'm sure that might, one of these days I might go on a tour and, and play a record from start to finish. Maybe, who knows? So I don't really hate this. And I mean, when I saw Metallica do Master Puppets from start to finish, I was pretty fucking stoked. And, you know, I saw Dancing do Dancing 3 at Riot Fest a couple of years ago. And then just, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw Quicksand do Slip from start to finish. And as a music lover and a music consumer, I love it. I get it. I get it. And also as a human being living in a chaotic fucking world, I understand all of this. I understand the need to feel comforted by the culture that we consume. Uh, but as someone that does create and is restless and wants to move, all of this can be slightly frustrating because there's no way you can compete with the record that people spent, you know, 25 years listening to or that shaped your life. Yes, pun intended. Or, you know, you went to a show and you met someone special at that show. You, you cannot replicate those feelings no matter how hard you try. And you can never replicate like how he felt to be young, even though nostalgia sort of hits a lot of those beats. So how do we balance the legacy of music and the force of nostalgia with um, creativity and letting bands and people move forward? I don't really think there's an easy answer to that. I think it's so ingrained in our culture that it's really hard to, to go beyond that. But there's a couple of little things that you can do to really help out. If your favorite band announces that they're going on tour or they're releasing a new EP, like it, share it, tell people. It will cost you nothing and will mean so much to these artists. Because long gone are the days of printed media telling you what shows to go to. Now it's all about the algorithm. And if you like and if you share, it will flow up in the algorithm and then people will be able to come to the show. Take the time to check out your favorite band's later albums. They might be great. Um, buy physical media, buy albums and merch when the band comes to town. And also have an open mind and realize that this is a journey. If we're lucky, we're on this journey together. Sometimes we just cross paths in the night. Um, and no matter how much I love the fact that, you know, people, people love Refuse, that's great. But there's nothing that warms my heart as much as seeing someone in the crowd that I've seen in the crowd for the past five years or 10 years, 15 years or 20 years, no matter what project I come to town with. That's, that blows my mind. And that journey to, to be able to do that together with an artist or with just friends, it's insanely amazing. Um, and I mean, I've had that a lot of times where the latest record that came out with one of my favorite bands, it wasn't what I wanted. And I went back a couple of years later, revisited it. I'm like, oh no, it's actually great because we're not traveling at the same speed and we're not going in the same direction. But um, sometimes, you know, you wear off track a little bit and that's fine. But just make sure, you know, make sure and realize that this is something that's happening. It's growing, it's evolving the whole time and music grows the same way as we grow as humans and we develop and you know it's a beautiful thing i love the fact that the legacy refuse is strong i still love to play those songs live i'm not bitter or angry about any of this i i, I love i love the fact that 25 years down the line 
we're still talking about this record that we put out. Um, but might be a bit worried about where we're going to end up if nostalgia get to dictate where the music world is going moving forward. Because there's so much great music out there. There's so many good songs, old songs you haven't heard. There's old artists that you haven't given a chance. There's so much fantastic new music that's being created as we speak. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. And I, I wish there was a little bit of a better balance between nostalgia and what's happening now. Because I always said, and I still believe, if people ask me, like, what's your favorite record of yours? I always say, the one that I'm working on right now because it all, it's all that matters at this moment. And I still think that's true. Um, yeah, thanks for listening to me rambling on about this. Uh, I think this is just probably, possibly a start of a conversation. I'm going to show you five records with bands that might have been reduced to nostalgia for a lot of people, but they kept pushing on. They kept releasing great records. So let's do that. You know how it is, like, you have a favorite band that you love and then one day you just stop listening to them and you stop paying attention. And it happened to me a lot of times where I'm like, oh shit, that band's still around. They, they're still putting out records. Wow, that's crazy. Um, and it just happens because of life. There's no real reason, you know. Maybe they put out something, you well, we're super excited about that and then just forget about them. Um, so I want to touch on a couple of bands that just kept doing great stuff. Um, the first band I'm going to talk about is, is this band Killing Joke. Here's a record from 2015 called Pylon. Killing Joke is one of those bands that they've done so much for like uh, the idea of what post-punk is, especially those first two records. Like you can't go to a show anywhere in, the, in a basement in the world without there being like a Killing Joke patch from those first two albums. Um, which are fucking fantastic, by the way. In the mid-80s, Killing Joke had almost like real commercial success. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the band changed and morphed and they just kept creating music. And um, this record from 2015 is a great example of the fact that Killing Joke is still great. Uh, Jess Coleman's voice and vision is still intact and it's, it's heavy industrial like almost metal but it's great and i think it's one of those things like bands that just keep pushing and, and putting out records and then um, you know they tend to get relegated to like oh you remember the first two killing joke records or maybe uh, you know that 80s song maybe that's it but um yeah i i would hard press to say like almost every killing joke record in the catalog is pretty cool it's worth checking out yeah maybe not as good as the first two records or maybe it's just different and uh yeah i think it's definitely worth uh following along on the ride so imagine imagine writing killing moon as a song and to follow that up i mean that's almost impossible um echo the bunny man is one of those bands that they've just been around forever and um, they were massive and then Ian McCulloch left but Echo in the Morning kept playing with a different singer and then Ian McCulloch got back and they've been releasing records throughout the 90s and the 2000s and unfortunately they're one of those bands that like yeah you remember Killing Moon and Lips Like Sugar and a couple of those old songs. Um, Invasion were lucky enough to tour with Echo and the Man years back and uh, they're playing a couple of new songs and I'm like, wait, these are great songs. And um, the album Meteorites from 2014 is a really solid, good record. And uh, the title track is fantastic and it's all, all in all just a really cool record. And uh, it is a shame that they probably played two songs from this record. But the two songs they play from this record, they were both fantastic. And they, they proved to me that it's not all about nostalgia. They still know how to write great songs and they still know how to put out really good records. I have to say that one of the music scenes that are uh, the, the, the best at not 
relegating everything to nostalgia is metal. That being said, like if you have a band where you put out three of the best metal albums of all time, and then you just keep on going, and then trends change, and then there's grunge, and then there's this and this and that, and you just keep pushing on and releasing great albums, uh, and always stay true to the course, that's pretty impressive. I'm, of course, talking about Slayer, and here's World Painted Blood from 2000, I can't even read, 2009. Um, Slayer did, of course, break up a couple years back, but they're one of those bands that, um, through peaks and valleys of their popularity, they've always remained incredibly consistent in their output. And I think this is one of the best later day era Slayer records. Um, I mean, there's maybe one Slayer record that I don't like that much, but maybe that's for another conversation. Um, but it is easy as a metalhead to be like, you, you Raining Bloods, uh, South of Heaven, and Seasons in the Abyss, that's it, you know. But yeah, they, they, they just kept putting up pretty fucking great records all along. Slayer. Getting the sun in my face. Um, I was in LA a couple of months ago and I went see, to see Iggy play. And Iggy's fantastic. Iggy's great. I've seen Iggy live 20 plus times at this moment. And when he does play, it is a little bit of a greatest hit cavalcade of uh, mainly old songs. But when you look at Iggy's discography from from even from the Stooges until the early stuff. And he's been decently consistent. I mean, he's put out a couple of stinkers, but all in all, his creative output has been pretty good. And um, 2019, he put out the record Free. I really like this record. Uh, it's a bit different, but it's still a great record. I think that defines a great artist that you just keep pushing on and keep being creative and keep putting out great records, even though I don't think he played any songs from this record when I last saw him, which is a shame. And um, I wish there was more space for people to, to be able to just not play the greatest hits. I think for me, there's always a bit of a sadness when you know you Motorhead put, put out a new record and then they go on tour and they play one new song and then it's just the same songs from the previous tour. Um, I kind of like what Iron Maiden did when they went on tour and they played the first two records from start to finish and then the next tour it's just a new record and then the next tour they did the next three records and then the next tour was the new record. I like that but then again not everyone's Iron Maiden. <laughs> yeah. So the last band I want to show you is uh, the post-punk logo that probably most people have tattooed on their body. Uh, I'm, of course, talking about Einstutz and the Neubauten. They put out their latest record, Alles in Allem, in 2020. And they're also one of those bands that very much got defined by the noise and the cacophony and industrial madness of uh, the early 80s. But they just kept put, putting out records and all of the records are pretty great. Obviously not as wild and chaotic as the early stuff, but they still keep pushing the boundaries. They still keep putting out fucking fantastic music and they're still being true to their own creative vision. And um, I have a very strong sense that they don't see themselves as nostalgia act at all. But for a lot of people, you know, when, when you think about Neubauten, you think about Collapse or, or some of the early records and you don't really talk that much about their later output, which I think is a shame because a lot of their later output is pretty cool. And there you have it, five records by five bands that uh, could have been written off a long time ago, but they just kept pushing on and, and creating great music. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm... You know, I'm any smarter when it comes to nostalgia and what, what, how to balance this. But at least it's a conversation. I hope you liked it. Um, what's your favorite nostalgia act? And what's your favorite act that's not a nostalgia act? Comments in the comments. Until next time, stay wild, my friends. Bye-bye.